our last video, we were looking on uh, 24th and Bancroft, that corner where the Grand Trunk freight sheds were. But before Grand Trunk was there, there was a manufacturing company there called Port Huron Engine and Thresher Company. But the company wasn't always called by that name. Previous to that, it was the Upton Thresher Company. In order to understand how this all came about to have the uh, plant be here in Port Huron, you have to start back in the city of Battle Creek. The story starts with a man named William Brown. Mr. Brown was a blacksmith in the city of Battle Creek, and also he made uh, small farm tools for the farmers. Then he expanded into a foundry, and then he expanded into making threshers or threshing machines. Everything I read in the archives of Port Huron, whether it be uh, internet or books, was always that Mr. Brown called his company the Upton Company. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he call it the Brown Company? It just didn't make sense to me. So then I started checking the archives of Battle Creek to see what I could find there. And here's what I found. In 1859, this gentleman came into the picture. His name was James Upton. He was a wealthy capitalist. He was an attorney. And he had his fingers in a lot of things in the Battle Creek area. A partnership was formed between William Brown and James Upton and others in 1859. The firm's name was changed to Upton, Brown & Company. Upton and Woods put their heads together and designed one of the finest threshing machines uh, in the country at that time. The increasing demand for their threshing machine made more capital advisable, and in 1861, the firm of J.S. Upton and Company was formed. The Upton Manufacturing Company was incorporated in 1874, a growing business and number of partners making the forming of a stock company advisable. The Upton Company was always sharply on the lookout for improvements. They weren't alone in Battle Creek. They had a competitor by the name of Nichols Shepherd and Company. Their threshing machine was called the Vibrator. Yes, I know, they wouldn't get away with that name today. It was decided that they would take the best features from the Vibrator and the best feature from their machine and combine them. And they came up with a, a threshing machine called the Combination. And that's the first time that the word combination was used in the agriculture industry, or the shorter version would be combine. Upton made threshing machines. They did not make any engines, however. There were engines on the market that were actually portable. These had to be pulled by horses and all went into the field where they were hooked up uh, to the threshing machine. Upton wanted to build a traction machine. Some of the farmers called it a traction locomotive, like you would a railroad locomotive. There were traction machines coming on the market at that time, but they were expensive to buy and they were expensive to run. Upton hired away two of the finest design engineers from his competitor, and together they designed this engine here, a design that eventually all Upton's competitors would copy. Business at Upton was better than ever. So that brings me to the second question I had. Why in the world would they move out of the place that they were at in Battle Creek and go someplace else? Well, Battle Creek historian Rob Gillespie answered that question. He says this. Well, Upton uh, really started to take off. I mean, he was doing great. And he had one problem, though to get his steam traction engines loaded on the rail, rail cars, he had to drive them through downtown. I mean, he's only over here by the, the research center. I mean, it's not like he had far to go, but he had to go about three blocks through downtown to get them on the rail car. And he was getting all sorts of complaints from the citizens, from the city. The city was trying to get industry out of the downtown area. It was supposed to be commercial and residential. And he said, okay, can I put a rail spur into my factory? And the city denied it. 
they did not want another train going through downtown. And if you remember the days when downtown was nothing but rail lines, um, you can kind of see where they were coming from. But Upton just kind of said, okay, you want to be that way about it? And he started looking around. And Marshall heard that he was looking for some place to go. And they made him an offer that they would build him a brand new plant bigger than the one he had. They'd put it on a rail line. They'd give him a 10-year tax break if he'd come over to Marshall and set up business over there. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Same thing's going on today, isn't it? <laughs> well, before he could accept the Marshall offer, Port Huron came in and said, we'll build you a bigger plant. We'll give you a longer tax break. Come on up here. And he did. So he ended up going up there. So he only built traction engines in town for about five or six years at the most. Um, the rest, uh, he went up to Port Huron, built farm equipment and Port Huron traction engines up there. And uh, he was in business up there until 1927, till the end of the traction era period. This transfer from one city to another occurred in 1885. But 10 years prior to that, in 1875, a debate took place during a city council meeting in Port Huron. The question of establishing a successful industry in that city had gone unanswered for several months. Deciding to take action, the city council concluded that such an industry was vital to the growth of Port Huron. The council authorized the task of securing a good business over to Charles E. Harrington, one of the city's prominent citizens. Harrington, along with two associates, met with several other citizens from Port Huron and received verbal commitments to invest capital in the proposed project. A total of 51 people subscribed for approximately $100,000 worth of stock in the company. At that point, Harrington proceeded to Battle Creek specifically to visit the Upton Manufacturing and make a deal. When a deal was made, it would have been with Mr. Upton, not Mr. Wood. Mr. Upton had bought out with the partnership of Mr. Wood sometime previously. Mr. Wood did stay on, though, as a superintendent of the factory and oversaw it. So in the end, Mr. Brown became an employee of the company that he started. Kind of ironic. In the fall of 1884, Upton accepted Port Huron's bid to move his factory to Port Huron. The patterns and machines were loaded up and hauled away. Mike Connell said this in one of his comments. Upton Works pretty much started Port Huron's transition to a manufacturing center. Before Upton, the community's economic foundation had been a three-legged stool, timber, ships, and railroads. Most of the employees didn't go from Battle Creek to Port Huron, they stayed in Battle Creek. And two of those that stayed were their star designers, and so they lost a lot of talent there. But they did keep a couple of apprentices, and they moved to Port Huron. Their last name was Dodge, John and Horace. They would go on to make the Dodge automobile. When they got to Port Huron, they would make friends with another pair of brothers, the Moak brothers, who would go on to do great things in South Park, including the Moak foundry. A building plan of various stages accommodated the facility by 1885, 20 buildings of different heights and sizes were constructed on a 40-acre parcel near 24th and Bancroft, right next to the tracks of the Electric Light Railroad Company. The Upton Manufacturing Company was no longer a Battle Creek Company. It was now a Port Huron Company. James Upton was the president of the company, and his son Frank was the vice president. As we look at this drawing, uh, look at the building where the arrow is. Well, that building there was the Upton offices and also the post office. Yes, they had their own post office. And if you notice, uh, it's on 24th Street. And uh, that 24th Street, there's no uh, underpass or viaduct there. You, you just had to drive over all those railroad tracks to get to the other side. Looking down from the satellite view, uh, in the area that has a perimeter of 24th Street, Bancroft, and the tracks, that triangle there, that's where 
uh, the old freight yards used to be, and that's where uh, Upton Manufacturing used to be, and later Port Yarn uh, Engine and Thresher Company. But the red uh, rectangle, that's where the uh, main offices were, and also their post office. On the other side of the tracks, where the other red rectangle is, that used to be a hotel called the Upton. And guess what street it was on? Upton Street. Once Upton Manufacturing was established there and uh, had their uh, workforce hired, that whole area became uh, known as uh, Uptonville because the homes around there were basically all the workers for the Upton Manufacturing Company. You have to realize that this was out in the boonies. I mean, it was a city unto itself, and that's why it was probably called uh, by that name, Uptonville. I don't know if the post office at the Upton plant took care of the Uptonville mail or not, but possibly. But if you look at this uh, picture here, you can see all that vacant land. I mean, cow pastures and everything else, but very, very few houses, maybe uh, a few houses before you got to 24th Street. On this map, as we zoom in, you can see it's called the Port Huron Engine and Thresher Company at that time, but basically it was the Upton before that. And if you look over to the left between uh, 24th and 25th Street in the, about in the middle of the block, if you've got 2020 vision or perhaps better, that's the actual hotel called the Upton. And then panning over to the right side of the uh, Thresher Company, you see that cluster of homes. And I'm sure all those are mostly uh, Upton workers that uh, were very conveniently located next to the plant. I say Upton homes, I sh really should say Port Huron Engine and Thresher homes because uh, the company, when they took over, loans were provided to loyal employees, cheap loans for uh, construction of a dwelling on company property, which was conveniently located near the factory complex. The Port Huron Company aggressively pursued this endeavor and created a mini city complete with a park and electric streetcar, Uptonville. The implications behind these gestures were that employees would stay put and the chances that these workers would seek other employment, unionize or become competitors themselves were reduced. You can also see how close it is to the railroad station. I found this map very interesting. All the places on here are either a, a city or a town for the most part. But uh, when we zoom in here and you look at that place between Port Huron and Smith Creek, you'll see it's not a city or a town. It's a company called the Upton Works. And I think that's a, a mistake there. I think what they should have been called would have been Uptonville. But it was on the map. In 1890, the Upton Manufacturing Company was merged into the Port Huron Engine and Thresher Company. Guess who had become president of this new company? It was the fellow that persuaded them to come to Port Huron in the first place, Charles Harrington. Harrington was a mover and shaker in Port Huron. He was also the vice president of Port Huron Savings Bank. He was the uh, president of the Harrington Hotel Company. He was the vice president of the Port Huron Light and Power Company. He was also the vice president of the McMoran Milling Company. And he was secretary to the Flint Pantaloon Company. A very busy man but probably knew nothing about the day-in and day-out workings of a thresher company. So he depended upon this man, Frank Peavy. He would be his vice president. And he was an Upton man. He started in Battle Creek uh, as a bookkeeper. He, and eventually became general manager of the plant. Join me in my next video and we'll look at part two of the Port Huron Engine and Thresher Company.